Would everyone take out your Bibles now and turn to 2 Peter chapter 3? We're finishing our study in the big picture. As Peter is an old man, he knows he doesn't have much longer to live. God is using him one more time to communicate not only the, to the church of his day, but also ours. And he's saying there are some really important big picture issues that you need to keep in mind. And this morning, we're wrapping up our entire study with the last section of verses. Next week, when we come back, we're going to start a four-week study in the book of Jonah. And I think there are some great lessons that God has for us. But today, we're pulling everything together that we've been studying, and we're picking up in uh, chapter 3, and there we go in verse 11, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. So follow along with me, would you? Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his word, his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, Make every effort to be found, whoa, we lost it on the back screen. All right, hold on. Make every effort to be found, where are we? I lost my place. I can look on my, uh, there we are. Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as, and I lost control of the screen. How's that? Hold on. Are we, all right? There we go. All right. I can do it this way too. All right. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes in the same way in all of his letters, speaking of them with these, in these manners. His letters contain some things. And let me pause for a second. This is so interesting as you're reading through this. It's almost like, and we know that God is the one who is inspiring Peter, Peter to write all of these things. But in this one verse, it almost feels like God is letting Peter's personality poke through a little bit more than in other places. Because he stops and he says, you know, Paul, when he writes, he writes some pretty heavy stuff. He writes some weighty matters that, quite honestly, are a little hard to understand. It's almost like Peter is going, yeah, you think you have trouble reading Paul's letters and understanding? I do too. And he said, but... Then, if it, it's hard enough to read and get all these great truths that he's talking about, but then he says, oh, ignorant men, unstable people, take those truths and they distort them as they do other scriptures, and they do this to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and from your secure position. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Wow. Over the last month or so, we've been looking at these big picture issues that God wants to remind us about in our lives and in our faith. Peter writes and says there are four big issues that God wants you to be remembering and focusing on. Your salvation, the importance of scripture in your lives, the issue of spiritual teachers. It's not just that you read the Bible, but that you're taught the Bible from people who are skilled and godly and they do not distort the truth. And then last week we saw this big picture issue of the future events that God has in store. And now as we come to this last section in the book, he says, in light of all of these big picture issues, how is that going to make a difference in our lives? How are we supposed to live in light of the big picture that God's presented us? And he does this in the most penetrating way when he asks in verse 11, since all of this is going to happen and this is just wrapping up that section of the future events. Since everything that you, you see here is going to be destroyed and remade, 
since we don't just live in this life but have everlasting existence, what kind of people ought you to be? Now, if you're taking notes, notice he did not ask, how should we live? First, he pushes us and says, what kind of people should you be? You see, there's a huge difference in who we are and just how we live. Who we are. What kind of people should we be? And it's not just in the, pres- in the moment. This verb is interesting not only because it speaks to the character of our lives, but it's a present tense verb in the original language. I, I put the tilde mark after the word be because it represents it is something that's supposed to be a habitual part of our lives. In other words, he's asking, how should we be every day, every day, every day of our lives? And in this passage, as Peter summarizes everything that's happening and how we are supposed to respond, he says, there are four things that God is looking for, even more than just looking for. There are four things that God is expecting in our lives as responses to the big picture. All these four areas that we've been looking at over the last several weeks. And every one of these four responses that God is looking for are communicated with imperative verbs. They're not options or suggestions. They are absolute commands. We are to be intentional. We are to be mindful. We are to be careful. And we are to keep on growing. Every one of these verbs in the original Greek language are written as imperatives. And I wish that the translators of our Bibles in English would put exclamation points behind each one of them so that we know they're not just suggestions or options. These are absolute commands by God to his people. So let's break them down and look at them individually. First, he says, we are to be intentional, intentional. This comes from verse 14 where we read, so then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to all of this, make every effort, make every effort is the command. Now, there are two different aspects of what this verb represents. In making every effort, first, there is an issue of intentionality. Very deliberateness that God is looking for in our lives. Many of you know my son, Adam. He's about 25 years old now. And when he started playing the violin at four years old, I, I was the one who took him to his lessons. I'll never forget when he got his first violin, the teacher took it from him, and she said, Adam, and here he is at his first recital. Oh, is it, that's my boy, you know. The tie he wore was longer than the violin. <laughs> I'll never forget that. But it was so interesting, taking him to that lesson that day, the teacher took his violin and said, Adam, you know, when people learn to play the violin, it's easy for them to just kind of put their fingers on the neck and try to find the note, but we're going to do something really important. We're going to put little pieces of tape, different colored pieces of tape on the neck at different places where each of the notes are, and that tape will show you exactly where you need to put your fingers. If any of you have studied Suzuki method. This is the way that they teach them when they get started. And she said, it's really important that you put your finger right at the exact place of the tape on the neck of the violin so you have the right note. You see, human nature tends to say, well, as long as I'm close, it's going to be okay. And she said, no, Adam, when you're learning to play the violin, you need to be very intentional. And she didn't use that word, but she said, you have to be very careful to put your finger right right on the mark. And that's the picture that Peter gives us in this verb. But it's more than just putting your finger on the right mark. Peter, in the, in the tense and the expression of this, says it needs to be more. You need to make every effort. That implies that you're supposed to strain to do it. 
Don't be casual about, oh, I'll get my finger on the right mark sooner or later. Oh, I'll be godly sometime. No. He says, I want you to strain, strain. I saw this picture of this guy running this race that he won. And the look on his face communicates exactly that sense of urgency and straining that God is looking for in our spiritual lives. That we're hitting the right mark and we're intentional about it. We're deliberate. We're straining to be spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Now those words are important. Spotless and blameless. The word spotless implies our character. The word blameless implies our reputation. There are a lot of people who have a reputation of being good people godly people, but there's all sorts of stuff going on inside that nobody else sees. Amen. There's a side to each of us that only God and we know. And I'm afraid that a lot of us, and I'm not just talking about the, the struggles that we all deal with, because we, we are all sinners, and we all still struggle at times. But there's a big difference between the struggles that we go through and a deliberate decision to say, you know what, it really doesn't matter. I'm going to live two different lives. I'm going to live the life that I want to live in my mind, my heart, and in my character. And I'm not going to let anyone else see that. And, and whenever that's happening, there's angst inside of us. There is no peace with God, only conflict. And Peter is saying, I want you to have a character and a reputation that are in sync, that are godly. Because when everything is working like that, the way that God intended it, then you're going to be able to experience peace with God, the peace of God. This is just carrying on the same thought that he's already communicated in verses 11 and 12 when he said, you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and in speed it's coming. The word holy is a very important word here. Now, literally, the word holy comes from the Greek word hagios, and the definition for hagias is simply to be set apart, to be unique, for special use. And I've shared with you this word is the picture that we all use at times when we say, you know what, at my house, we have a set of holy plateware. We have a set of holy glasses. We have a set of holy silver and dining utensils. We keep it in a box in the living in, in the in the dining room under a cabinet and when company comes out, oh, we pull out the holy plateware. We call it china. We get the holy glasses and we set them on down to the crystal. We get the holy silver and we put it on the table. It doesn't go in the cupboard with the regular stuff. We are uniquely set apart. We have been uniquely set apart from the world. That's what it means literally. Now, when it's used in a spiritual sense, it implies something else. It's more than just that we're set apart, but there is a virtuousness, purity, blamelessness, that we are different from the world. We think differently. We live differently. We're different from what we once were when we were unsaved. Amen. And God calls us to be different people. The real challenge, the real problem that we have today in evangelicalism, especially here in America, is that many of us have forgotten that God calls us to be different. Amen. In fact, George Barna of the Barna Group writes that as he has studied the issues of the church, he writes that while that more than 85% of Americans claim to be Christians, there is absolutely no statistical difference in worldviews, values, or behaviors of self-identified born-again Christians versus non-believers. Our values are just like the world's. Our ethics, our morality is still the same as it once was when we were unsaved. 
Oh, we claim to be followers of Jesus, and recipients of his grace, but there's never been a change in our lives. It's one of the reasons why the church is so weak and anemic in our culture today. And God says, no, that, that shouldn't be. You should be straining to hit the mark of holiness in your life. You ought to be straining to be different than once you once were. God says Christians are to live as differently from the world in our morality, our ethics, and our values as God himself is different from the world. We're to be holy. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. I love this. God saved us, and God called us not just to be saved, but to live a holy life, to be different. He did this not because we deserve it, but it was his plan from the very beginning. Somewhere in eternity past, God looked ahead and said, and God lives in the present in the same way he did in the past, but God looked at me and he said, that's Steve Miller. He's a sinner, he's lost, he's condemned, but I choose to love him and I choose to call him. I choose to give him the opportunity to respond to the gospel and to be saved. And it's not just that, but I, I purpose that Steve will be holy. Holy different. Holy separated. You can't be casual about this. You have to be intentional. Look at your lives and say, all right, are there some areas in my life that I'm missing the mark, that I've just been, oh, I'll get there someday. And we can't. he says, are you putting your finger on the right mark and are you straining to make that happen? Be intentional in your life. But then Peter pushes us to the next and he says, be mindful, mindful. And the verb here, again, is an imperative command. <clears throat> bear in mind. Now, when was the last time you used that phrase, bear in mind? Most of us would communicate this principle by saying, keep remembering, keep remembering. Don't let yourself forget. Keep remembering that our Lord's patience means salvation. We looked at this last week. Why hasn't Jesus come back yet? God is working a plan. And that plan is to keep on reaching more people. Giving more people the opportunity to be saved. Remember how we saw in verse 8 when Peter said, Stop forgetting the imperative command. Stop forgetting that God is patient, not wanting anyone, anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Amen. Look. The moment you and I got saved, God could have taken us to heaven. He said, that's it. What else do I need you on earth for? You're saved. But he left us here for a reason. Every one of us have relationships in our lives with people who are unsaved. Now, I know sometimes when we get saved and we're just coming out of the world, we have lots of friends who are still unsaved, and then we start building friendships with believers in the community of the church, or as we get older, we're kind of, you know, there are people at Village Woods and others that are community homes, and our contacts are a little less opportunists to reach the others who are unsaved, but, you know, I can tell you that in every one of our lives, there's someone who's unsaved. A family member, a co-worker, a neighbor, a classmate. There is someone in your life right now that God has chosen to bring into your life so that you can be the light, so that you can be one of those people who share. And God is pushing you, challenging you. Get out of your comfort zone. Listen, folks, if people matter to God, then they need to matter to us. And if God wants them to be saved and God has deliberately brought those people into your life who need Christ, he's chosen for you to be the light. He wants you to be a witness. Even those people who drive you crazy, those people who are the knuckleheads in your life that just, you feel like, man, they just, are they just there to make me miserable? And no, no. In fact, the ones who are sometimes the hardest to deal with are the ones that God chose to bring into your life so you could be the light, maybe the most. 
So let me challenge you in light of the big picture, the fact that we're all going to live somewhere forever. When was the last time you shared Christ with someone? When was the last time that you really said, God, show me today, who is it in my life that you've brought so that deliberately I can, I can share Jesus with? Family members, neighbors, co-workers, classmates, people at the gym, wherever it is in your circle of influence, in your relational sphere of, of sharing, who is that person? Have you said, God, just show me. And then, God, I'm going to step out of my comfort zone somehow, and I'm going to just pray that you'll create that opportunity. God isn't looking for theologians. God is simply looking for people who are willing to, to share. And it doesn't have to be a complex message about every aspect of theology. He's simply saying, would you be willing to say, hey, can I tell you about the most important relationship in my life? Can I tell you what God's been doing in my life that is so amazing? I just want to share it with you. I want to tell you about this. When was the last time you let God use you to tell someone else about Jesus? Has it been a month? Maybe six months or a year? Have you ever stepped out of your comfort zone and shared Jesus with someone? See, God's plan in the big picture is that all of us are going to be witnesses. All of us are going to be sharing. All of us will find that person or people in our lives that God has brought that are unsaved, unbelievers, who are lost and they are not going to be able to find Christ unless someone, someone is willing to share. This is what Paul is all about in Romans 10 when he says, how can they, the unbelievers, call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? But even more, how can the unbelievers hear about him unless someone tells them? And isn't this cool? He says, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. Let me ask you honestly, when was the last time you looked at your feet and went, now that's the most attractive part of my body, you know? Most of us, Ugh. no, but when God... God sees someone who's willing to, to go and share Jesus with others. He looks at you and says, you have beautiful feet. Woohoo! You have good-looking feet because they're willing to walk and they're willing to share. Wow. Wow. So God calls us to be intentional about who we are and how we live. He's challenging us to keep on remembering that he's bringing people into our lives so that we will share Jesus with them. And then he pushes us to the third response. And he says, be careful. Be careful. And this term, to be careful, is used in a military sense. Very powerful. When in verse 17 he says, Dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard. Be on your guard. The phrase be on your guard in our English language, four words, is really from one simple Greek word, that word philoso. The word philoso literally means to guard, to keep, to watch, protect. As you study through the New Testament, this Greek word, philoso, is translated with all of these different words. It's used of a soldier who is guarding a prisoner, and if that prisoner was to escape, they would lose their life. So they're going to guard, they're going to keep him, they're going to watch him carefully. The same word is used of shepherds who are responsible shepherds who guard the flock, who watch the flock. It's used of pastors who are commanded to watch over the flock so that false teachers don't come in. He's saying, I want you to be on your guard. Be careful. Be watching. Be guarding. Be protecting your spiritual life. 
more than anything else. We put locks on our doors, we lock our cars, we do all these other things with the physical things of our life. And he says there's something even more important than that, and that's your spiritual life. I want you to be on guard. I want you to keep. I want you to watch. I want you to protect. Dear friends, since you've been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away with the error of the lawless these false teachers and fall from your secure position. That phrase, secure position, is really interesting. We have a little bit under, of understanding when Paul writes, or Peter writes and says, look, these, these letters that Paul writes sometimes are a little heavy. They're a little confusing and, and challenging to understand. That's true. But what's the real problem isn't the fact that Paul writes these weighty matters that are a little challenging to us as believers. What's really a problem is the fact that there are godless people who take those letters and they distort them as they do other parts of the scripture. And for those people who distort the truth, this is going to end up in their destruction, their damnation. Some people have read this and goes, wow, falling from your secure position or damnation, and they think that that implies that we can lose our salvation. I, I don't agree with that interpretation at all. There are too many other places in the New Testament that describe the fact that if a person is truly born again into the family of God, they can't lose it. Jesus is our, our lawyer, and every time we sin, as we, as we sin, he stands up and speaks in our defense in First John. It's a powerful reality. I don't think at all that it implies you can lose your salvation. But as you understand what Peter is writing, and the words are translated in a little bit more of a literal sense, it literally says, as in the English Standard Version and the Holman Christian Standard, don't fall from your stability. The NLT and the NIV says, don't lose your sure or secure footing. Now, that, that's a completely different thing than losing your salvation. In the context, we understand that he's talking about making sure that we have good teaching, that we're eating good spiritual food in our lives, that we're not having distorted understandings of God's word. Because it's only as we're feeding healthily, healthily and we're, we're involved in godly growth in our lives that we experience the fullness of our relationship with Christ that we are walking in our relationship with Christ with spiritual stability. We don't need to be slipping around because of false teaching in our lives. And so, to put it this way, Peter is challenging all of us, saying that Christians are always to be vigilant in guarding the sincerity, the integrity of our spiritual lives. And we are protecting the security of our walk with Christ through sound knowledge of God's Word. That's why it's so important that we study God's Word with carefulness. Be careful, be careful, be careful to make sure you're getting truth, truth, truth. And so... We're challenged to be careful. But then he pushes us to the last response. And this one I love. He says, I want you to keep growing. See, God intends living things to be healthy. And healthy things, when they're alive, grow. And he says, I want you to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Again, I love this verb. It's interesting because it's not just an imperative command. It's what we call a present imperative. It implies that you don't just grow a little bit when you get saved and you're a newborn believer, but the growing process is supposed to happen all the time, day after day after day. If you've been a Christian for five years, you should be stronger and more mature than you once were. But the challenge is that for some of us, we get to a certain point and we just say, okay, that's it, and we start coasting. 
God says, no, I want you to keep on growing. After five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, you ought to be farther along in the development of your spiritual maturity than you were. Are you, as a believer, more mature than you were a year ago? Or two years ago, or five, or 10, or 20? Or have you reached that point where, hey, I'm saved, and I'm familiar with the word, and I'm okay, and I'm going to kind of coast my way at this point. Are you coasting? Last week, I shared with you that of all the late night comics and hosts, I don't know of any that are as vicious against Christianity as Bill Maher. And it was interesting as I was reading some of the things that Bill Maher has written about the church, there was one that I came across that he said that I kind of had to agree with. Bill Maher once said, to most Christians, the Bible is like a software license. Nobody really reads it. They just scroll down to the bottom and they click, I agree. That's it. I'm afraid that some of us have reached the point where we don't really read it. We just, do you believe that Jesus is Savior? Sure, I agree. Do you believe he's coming again? Sure, I agree. Do you agree with all these other? Yeah, sure, I agree. And that's it. But not because we've really dug into this, not because we're really growing and we're feeding the Bible as our food and drink of our souls and we ingest it and and it's something that's a regular daily part of our lives. We've gotten to the point where, yeah, I agree. Wow. There's something powerful that's missing. We've started, instead of growing, we're starving ourselves. And God is challenging us in light of the big picture of all these things that he wants to do in the world and in and through our lives. He's saying, I want you to keep growing. Christians find their greatest fulfillment as we continually grow, grow in the process of discipleship. And what should that look like? We ought to be knowing more about Christ. We ought to be thinking more like Christ. We ought to be living more like Christ in every part of our lives. No compartmentalization. We are saying, okay, God, I want to keep growing in all of these things. Knowing about Christ because I'm constantly studying the Word. Thinking like Christ because the word is saturating into my mind and my heart and I am being transformed by his spirit. And I am living like Christ so that my family, my coworkers, my neighbors, people who see me in general say, wow, there's something really different about that person now. That's the challenge that God gives to every one of us. He's pushing us, pushing us, pushing us. And God is speaking and challenging every one of us to keep growing, growing. And there are four general areas of discipleship that ought to be a part of every one of our lives here this morning. We ought to be involved in personal worship. Now, it's not enough to simply come on Sundays and we're involved in corporate worship with the body of Christ. That's important. But even in our personal lives throughout the week, there ought to be a sense of personal worship. I don't mean that we all walk around singing all the time, but there ought to be an interaction with God through his spirit and his word that acknowledges him to be worthy. See, worship is nothing but professing, proclaiming in the way that I think and the way that I live the worthiness of Jesus in my life, the worthiness of God, the worthiness of his spirit to have control over me. And personal worship is coming to that point where on a daily basis, you are acknowledging the worthiness of Christ. We ought to be involved in Bible study. Again, not just when we come here. But we ought to be involved in Bible study through our personal and our daily devotions. I challenge you, if you're not involved in a small group, you can do that and be a part of the growing knowledge of Christ in your life and at the same time, building personal relationships. I tell people all the time, every time you come to Village Church, three things ought to happen right off the bat. And every week, if these three things don't happen, then you've missed what the fullness of the experience of being here should be. 
We ought to be growing in our knowledge of the word. There should be clear Bible teaching. There ought to be dynamic worship in our lives, and you should be building loving relationships. Every time you come to Village Church, every single time you're here, those three things ought to happen. You're growing in the knowledge of the word, you are dynamically worshiping, and you are building loving relationships. And then, not just here, but outside, the fourth area that discipleship includes is kingdom service. There is something for everyone to be doing in the kingdom work. And if all you're doing is coming and you're soaking in, but you're not giving out, if you're not being used by God to build the kingdom through active service, then there's something missing in your discipleship walk, in your discipleship development, in the personal growth that God has for you. There is a job for everyone in the kingdom. God has given you his spirit and and gifts that he intends you to use for his kingdom. Every one of us has something that we can be doing. And so we're looking at these four areas saying, okay, if I'm going to keep on growing, I need to develop. And if you're looking at that list of four things and going, all right, there's one or two things that are missing. My challenge this morning is that in light of the big picture of what God is doing in the world and in your life, say, okay, God, hey, I need to spend more time in worship. I need to spend more time in Bible study. I need to build some spiritual relationships. I need to get to work. I need to do something because when we die, this isn't the end. This is just the beginning of our everlasting existence. So the challenge is, what are you doing right now in your life to keep growing in your walk with Christ? In light of the big picture of everything that God is doing in the world, in the church, And in our lives, we are called to be intentional, to be mindful, to be careful, and to keep on growing. Keep on growing. And when that happens, when you and I are engaged in a dynamic way, when you and I are involved in our spiritual lives and we are actively pursuing with intentionality and deliberateness, when we are straining for these things, when all of this is happening in a dynamic way in every one of our lives, wow, that's when God really starts to move. The Holy Spirit is at work in us, through us, around us dynamic, miraculous things start happening in us and around us. And God says, that's the way I intended. And when that's all happening in the church and in our personal lives, Jesus Christ is going to be honored and glorified. And we are going to fulfill this amazing prayer, this very simple doxology that Peter closes his book. To him, Jesus, be glory both now and forever and ever and ever. Amen. That's what this is all about. That's what this is all about. And it starts with each of us saying yes. That's all, yes. God isn't looking for highly trained people. God isn't looking for highly talented people. God isn't looking for highly wealthy people. He's simply looking for people who will say yes, yes. In light of the big picture of what you have planned, I just want to say yes. Yes. Father.